So thanks for allowing me to be here tonight. I truly am honored. Um, for somebody like the esteemed Dr. Lewis or, or Deborah Hendricks, speaking to a crowd like this is probably nothing. I am a shy banker, and I might think that away <laughs> any moment now, but uh, I will try to get through this, and, and um, I'm honored to share my story. Uh, when Deborah and I first talked about me sharing my testimony, I was uncertain if uh, what I had to say would really have any relevance with y'all, but... Okay, is this better? Can I get feedback? Or, okay. Um, but if Deborah believes it, then I'm happy to share it. And so uh, I, I will share humbly with you about my road to break the cycle of poverty uh, through education. So I am a first generation on my father's side to be born in America. Uh, my grandparents were actually in Auschwitz. They were in prison for being Polish. And they met while they were in the resistance. They were putting together munitions to try to help the resistance in Auschwitz. And so when the camp was reformed, they did get married and they had two children and moved from Germany to the United States. They moved to a, a little city called Botno, North Dakota, right up on the Canadian border, colder than all. In fact, I'll tell you, in the wintertime, if you breathe in through your nose, your nostrils freeze shut. It's that cold. It's ridiculous. The leather on your car seats is as hard as cement in the winter. But um, I'm happy to be in Colorado Springs. We came here when I was three. My parents met and married in Botany, North Dakota, and moved us to Colorado Springs when I was three years old. And I'm 21 now, so I've been here a good long time. <laughs> Still a Bronco fan, as frustrating as they are, um, but I grew up here in Colorado Springs, went to school here and everything, and, and uh, really had a pretty idyllic childhood. Um, my parents were so good about expressing their love for us and taking care of us. I do always remember an underlying theme, though, of how um, stressful it was for them as they tried to make ends meet. Uh, my dad would work two and three jobs at a time to keep food on the table. In fact, he was a paper boy. I don't know if this generation even knows what a paper is, but they, he would throw papers in order to have some extra income. He drove a school bus, just whatever it took. Nothing you know, was beneath him to do that. My brother and I were on the free and reduced lunch plans in public school. And that was a little embarrassing because when you go to give your ticket to the lunch attendant, Mine was blue, and all my friends' were white, and so sometimes I'd be just too embarrassed to eat lunch at all, but it seemed to bring my parents a great deal of comfort that my brother and I were getting a hot lunch, and so I didn't argue too much. I just put up with it. So once I graduated from high school, I went to uh, college, and I did a semester in college, and then I met and married a man who ended up not being at all who I thought he was, Seven years in that marriage, and two kids later, he decided he was in love with somebody else and, and left us for her. Um, and so there I was with two kids on my own, sporadic child support, and a, I, I was working in telemarketing just 10 hours a week, which I hated. I hated it so bad. I would cry whenever I had to get on the telephone and dial for dollars. But you do what you got to do. I remember the day my life changed. Um, I woke up, it was freezing cold in our town home uh, because I had to decide, was I gonna pay the rent? Was I going to pay the heating? Was I going to buy groceries? What was I going to do? And I had to kind of push bills out into the future. So I constantly kept my heating bill as low as I could by, by keeping the place uh, not very warm. One night, my son woke up with a piercing scream. He was about two. I knew. I knew that piercing scream meant there was an ear infection about to take place. So we got a doctor's appointment, and seeing how it was cold, I went out into the parking lot and started our pickup. We had a little 1970 Chevrolet Love with just the front bench, and we all three could find on that. Today, that would be totally illegal because there was no room for car seats. Um, but I went out to start it, and it wouldn't start, and so I got somebody to jump the battery, 
Well, it turns out jumping a battery on a vehicle when the timing chain is about to go out is the absolute worst thing you can do, and that pretty much annihilated that vehicle. Okay, so I think to myself, well, we'll handle that in a little bit. As was customary with my son when he would get an infection, an ear infection, he would get sick to his stomach. And so I thought, I'll just quickly go throw a load of laundry in and then deal with everything else. And so I plotted down the stairs, threw a load of laundry in the machine, started it up, started back up the stairs, not really thinking much of it, and that dumb machine ground to a halt. Stone cold, nothing. I kicked it, I turned dials, I screamed at it, I did everything that I could think of to make this stupid washer work, and it just wouldn't. So I slammed the, the lid down just in sheer frustration and anger for the way my morning was going, and started back up the stairs, and I was screaming at God, and I was saying, you said you would be a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widows, and I am not a widow, but I did not make this choice for my children and I, and we are alone, and I expect, God, that you are going to fix my washing machine. Maybe not the smartest way to go, but uh, I started back up the stairs and got about three stairs up, and that darn machine started. Now, <laughs> science would tell you that it probably slammed the lid so hard that I jarred a wire the right way and it was able to come back to life. But I know, God fixed my washing machine that day. I couldn't get it to die after that. That thing ran and ran. I wanted a new machine so bad, but why? If it kept working. So, so, um, so then, now, fast forward to that evening, I used to do this really sick thing, y'all. Because money was so tight, I would keep empty boxes, like cereal boxes, cartons of milk, I just keep an empty carton just to kind of give the illusion that we had food, we were okay. Well, that night I had, I realized, a box of macaroni and cheese and one can of pineapple, not even the milk to make the macaroni and cheese. So I spread towels all over the living room, beach towels. I told my kids, we're gonna have a luau. You know, all good luau's have Kraft macaroni and cheese, don't you know? And uh, so it was the worst. I, I didn't even have any milk, so it was, I, I couldn't even choke it down. Anyway, I still can't eat macaroni and cheese to this day. It makes me gag. But I uh, put them to bed and had another little tantrum with God and, and just really was wrestling with where do I go from here. Called a neighbor of mine and said, listen, my car won't start. I've got no food. I need to go to this place called the Food Stamp Office on Spruce Street. Have you heard of it? She said, yeah, I'm giving you a ride there. So I get there, and they tell me before they can grant any food stamps, I have to meet with a counselor. Great, I'm thinking. Now I need a shrink to help evaluate my state of mind, and I was not happy about this at all. But the counselor that I got, um, Goodwill used to have a program called Welfare to Work, and it was counselors who would help you um, grow in your life, whether it was by providing child care or energy assistance or any of that stuff. And that counselor said to me, you need to go back to college. You need a degree. And I said, I'm not smart enough to even fill out the college application. She said, I'll help you. I said, I'm a single parent. I have two kids. I can't possibly do that. She said, I'll help you get daycare. I, could, I realized this lady was not going to relent. She was certain that I needed to go back to school, so I, to get her off my back, I just kind of said, let me think about it. Went home and, and was granted emergency food stamps and everything was okay, but when I got home, I looked at the faces of my children, my precious, innocent children, and I thought, you know what? They deserve so much better than this. I was a mother who was not present. I was present physically, but you know, when you're so wrapped up in stress, you're not there mentally, emotionally, just not present for anything. And I was exhausted. I was exhausted from shuffling bills. I was exhausted from trying to figure out how I was going to make it work. I was exhausted with an ex-husband who wouldn't, he might pay child support or he might withhold it, depending on how he was feeling about that certain month. And I, I called that counselor and I said, yes, I am going to go back to college. 
Little did I know what I was in for, but I did. I went back to uh, UCCS and went to college and was able to work two jobs while um, I was there on campus. I worked for the daycare so that I could take my kids to work with me. I taught preschool there, and I also worked in the bursar's office. And, um, you know, we would sit at the kitchen table to do our homework side by side every night. And, and they learned um, a lot about tenacity and not giving up and grit. And I did graduate with both my undergraduate and my master's degree. And, um, yeah, thanks. I was pretty proud of it. <laughs> so, and that opened up so many doors for me, so much opportunity. College is what broke my cycle of poverty. It set us free. And I want my children to understand that. Now, they work hard, too. They don't feel entitled. They, they know that they have a good education. We have a good education system in this city. But they're not entitled. They know that they're going to have to work hard for what they want within this education system. I was able to be involved in my kids' classrooms all the time. I was like a fixture in their class. Sometimes I'm sure the teachers were like, please just go away because I always had to, you know, tell them my opinion about why my son wasn't catching on to reading or whatever the case may be. But my daughter for Christmas this year, she gave me this, I don't know if you can see it, pearl necklace. And she said, Mom, the reason I gave you this pearl necklace is because pearls are made of grit that constantly gets beat down and sanded up until they turn into something beautiful. And she said, you have more grit than anybody I've ever known. And um, I, I was glad that she was able to see that. And I'm just, I'm really thrilled to be here with you. I admire you all so much. I would just encourage you to always be an advocate for your children and their, your children and their education. They kind of need that leg up. We need to start them with a good education so that they can have all the doors that can possibly open to them. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. I wish you all a wonderful Tuesday evening. Hello, everybody. First of all, that food was so good. And here I am. I was like, I'm just going to eat very well. I'm going to watch what I eat. I started that yesterday and changed my mind today. <laughs> That beignet and the pecan pie was amazing. So I'm going to go home, and I'm not going to tell anybody that I ate anything. <laughs> no, I'm really glad to be with all of you this evening. I've been really excited to have an opportunity to get back with you and all of our four-plus parents um, being here and what you have done. But I just want to kind of put you in a situation real quick a situation that I found myself in this past Sunday. So this past Sunday, I went to church. And I'm there, you know, I, I had to speak that day and got ready to leave. And this lady kept, ooh, ah, ooh. She's trying to catch up with me. And she says, Dr. Lewis, I have something for you. And she's going through her purse. And she hands me this million dollar bill. Now my knees like to buckle because see, I've never seen a million. Anybody seen a million dollar bill before? Is there such a thing? Is there like a million dollar bill? I need to know because I need to go find it, right? And I'm looking at this thing and even though it wasn't real, it was as significant as if it were real because she asked me, she says, what will you do this year to reach a million dollars? What will you do? And I just stopped. It, it just stunned me because I, I thought, well, maybe I, I've not thought that big yet. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do this year for a million dollars. So what I want you to do is I want you to just think for a moment. If someone said, here's a million dollars, you only have to give it back if you do not get it. 
I mean, you know, if you don't, if you don't make a million dollars somehow, some way, you got to give it back. What would you do? What would you do to get to a million dollars? Well, a million dollars is less than what your children are worth. Less than. Everything that you do, everything that I do, is building beyond a million dollars for someone who is worth way more than that, and that's our children. What do you do, what will you do to get to that million dollars? Now, it's easy for us to tell our children what they need to do. Go to class, do that homework, do this, do that. That's the easy part. But what will you do? As many of you have heard and I've shared with you my story, I have told you that I had a deal with my son. And that deal was that I was going to go back to school. I wasn't going to stop until I got my PhD, but I was going to get it before he graduated from high school. And what I needed him to do was to watch me, to follow me, to understand and to see firsthand what it is to be disciplined, dedicated, and determined. This is not something that's just innate, that's just automatically in us. It has to be explicitly taught. And our first teacher are our parents or those who are our guardians. If we can't show them, they're going to learn it from someone else. And it may not be the right way. So there were some of you that might remember I used to have a scholarship. And it was the Action Pack Challenge. And that scholarship was set up so that you would write down and you would commit to achieving something, something that would demonstrate those three things for your children. And at the same time, your child would be watching you while they are reaching their goal. And those who set these goals, they would receive, if they were selected, they would receive a scholarship. But the true scholarship wasn't that scholarship. The true scholarship was what you demonstrated that's implanted in your children the rest of their lives. It was really important. So what would you do? What would you do? So we have spent, this is the third uh, meeting, so it was a series of three, that I met with many of the parents, and I challenged them through a process. It was called the red paper clip. Now, those of you that were not a part of that, have you ever heard of it? The red paper clip. The red paper clip basically was this guy 21 years ago who said, I used to play this as a kid called Bigger and Better. And he would just take this red paper clip and he would trade it for something bigger and better. And then when he would get that, he would trade that up and he would keep trading it until finally he realized there was something about this that he decided to set a goal for himself that he wanted to get a house. He wanted to keep trading until he got a house. And in one year, he received the keys to his own house that he only got through trading, not through cash. It was phenomenal. So I challenged many of the parents here. Let's do this. Let's go in and let's see what we can come up with. And everybody got this red paper clip. 
And when they went on this journey, I said, okay, we're going to come back, and I want to hear what you got. I want, to, I want to know what you have. And I didn't hear too much. At first, I didn't hear anything, and I thought, oh, no. And then one person said, hey, I got all these figurines that was worth a lot of money. And I was like, what? And then somebody else said, well, I got a coffee maker. Where, where did you hide that? In your shirt? Or, you know, how, how'd you bring it in here? And then I kept seeing more and more things. There was a desk thing. And I, I mean, it just kept going on and on. And I was absolutely floored. And then there were some that didn't get anything. And there was something that stopped them. And that's worth looking into. What stops you? What stops you from going out and getting what you want? Because it's out there. Anything and everything you want is right out here for you to get. But it takes you. It takes communication. And so there's something to be said about that. So after people got all kinds of stuff, then we went through this trade thing in the moment, live. People are passing things, and I would like this, and I mean, they're all over the place. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And I left them with, now I want you to set a goal. Because when we go out here and we're just seeing what we can get, we might get some things. But it may not reach the goal we're really trying to achieve. And to get to that point, we really have to make a decision. What is our goal? And being very clear on that. And when you do, you can get to that goal much quicker. I don't care if it's a million dollars. I don't care if it's a home. I don't, I don't care if it's your education. We just heard from our speaker. That's something that she chose to do. I'm going to go back to school. And guess what? She did. And she got not just one degree, two. Because it happens, and now she's VP. I mean, can you, is she seeing you? Oh, well, wait a minute. Where's she at? Oh, there she is. Are you hiring? I need another job. I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, just phenomenal. Phenomenal. Do you know Wayne Bland? I do. So Wayne met me before I was Dr. Lewis, before I started college, everything. And he used to tell me, Regina, let me help you to get a home. You can do it. And I never took him up on that offer. I was afraid. I had everything in my head telling me why I could not. Why I could not. I finally purchased a home almost 20 years later. I could have had it so long ago, so long ago. It's just about you telling yourself yes. Tell him I said hi. But where are you now? I want to hear some of those goals that you set. Now, we already talked about them. There was, there was some really lofty goals, what people said that they were going to achieve and they were going to try to go out to get. Now, before we, you share in front of everybody, what was your goal? What did you set? I know, people are like, oh, please don't ask me. I hope we run out of time. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So I am a teacher first. But what I am going to have you do is I want you to talk at your table because there should be at least one. Is it four plus or four? Eight. Four plus. Four plus. There should be at least one four plus person at each table. And I want that person or persons to share that. What was your goal? Did you achieve it? If so, well, you know, great. If you didn't, why not? 
So I want you to talk. I'm going to listen. Now, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to let you talk at the table, right? <laughs> Only for like two minutes. And then I'm going to say, okay, we're coming back. And guess what? People are going to be saying, I know, right? So I'm going to count down. I'm going to say in five, four, and then you'll start talking faster. Okay, oh, it's three. Okay, I've got to do it. And then two, one, and we should all come back, okay? All right, so go ahead and start talking. Did you achieve it? If so, what would you get? Okay, we're going to go ahead and come back together in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, wow, this is pretty good. Congratulations, you all did really good. Thank you for coming back. Now, let me tell you, I'm sure that there are people sitting at your table that were sweating bullets, like, oh my gosh, I didn't do it. I'm going to make up something really good. <laughs> Listen, I hear you. OK, that's fine. But only you have to know what the truth is, right? So and I'm just teasing with you. I mean, because really, uh, you know, we have different ways in which we work and deal. But I, I want to hear, first of all, before hearing, I want to know by a show of hands, how many of you actually reached what you planned, whatever your goal was, and you set out and you said, this is what I'm going to achieve, and you actually did it? Did anybody? Holy wow, woo-woo-wee. All right, so I'm going to start over here. <laughs> did y'all hear me? I'm going to start over here. And I want to hear... What was it that you set? I'm going to come close to you because then you, you can do the mic. So I want to start at the far end. Um, okay, I think you had your hand up. Let's see. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Is that me? I mean, oh my. With your fly hat. Go ahead. Okay, Miss Regina. Yes. Hold on. I'm going to do this. Okay. Yep. Yeah, keep it away. Yeah. So back in November, mm -hmm. when I met with everybody, I said I was have a new job. So with my paperclip challenge, what I decided to do was I decided to choose myself. So I was working in healthcare and I quit my job two weeks ago. Um, I was working a, a high stressful job in healthcare and I decided to choose myself. So in the last two weeks, I've been getting myself together at home with organization because I said I had a lot of clutter that I don't need. And for me to think clearly, I need to get myself in order. So that's what I'm doing, so to be continued. All right, let's give her a hand. This is fantastic, fantastic. Okay, let me just scan over here. Who else over this way had their hand up? Who over here? Okay, here we go, and then I'll come to you. And you know what, I'll hold the mic. I don't know why I handed the mic. I know, I didn't think about it, but I'm like, oh no, I don't have no hand sanitizer. I'm sorry, I'm just saying this. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the first time I just told, like, was honest with my table, and I said I decided not to do it. I said like, no, I this is not for me. I won't do the paper clip at all. But then after the November meeting, I realized that I really I was not motivated for anything material, but the whole setting a goal um, really spoke to me, and I felt like I started like looking what is what I need and what are the talents that I have to trade. Um, and that's what I keep. So I wanted to start doing exercise and I know that it's something that I cannot do by myself. So I, my goal was to find a personal trainer. And I know that those are expensive, so I just couldn't afford it. But I, I was thinking I can trade um, Spanish classes, right? And then I 
couldn't find anyone. And then all of a sudden, a Spanish speaker, personal trainer, I met, and she has a jewelry business as well. And she, she just mentioned, like, I need someone to help me organize my store. And I said, would you trade that? Like, if I help you once a week, can you be my personal trainer and, you know, work, to work out together? And she said, yes. So. <laughs> That's awesome. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. I mean, we have these talents, and it was neat that you said, let me look deep inside and see what talents I have inside. That is great. Okay, right here. You know, but I said, I wanna, my goal was to get my son into a basketball club, and I was looking, and I didn't know where to look and who to ask, and one of the coach who was teaching at the school, he was not a part of the school, but he was just teaching, the, coaching the team. Um, we prayed and felt like it's a good because it's a Christian Valley based basketball like this. Not just look for athletic ability, but they look character every day. So we end up sending a boy there. And I also encourage my son because he said he want a personal coach or trainer to teach him basketball. And I ask him to, why don't you ask? Nothing wrong to ask. Maybe he will say no. So one of his counselor, he asked, and he said, okay, I will do it for you. $10 an hour to teach you private basketball. Wow, that is fantastic. And he wouldn't have known if he didn't ask. Yeah, so I told him, like, ask. Just ask. No. Yeah, right. I mean, you would be no further away from it than you were before you asked. So that's great. That's fantastic. Okay, right here. Look at this baby. So um, I was the weird one that brought the Keurig, actually. Um, Where did you hide that thing? No, I'm just joking. It was in a box. Okay. <laughs> um, so I brought that because I found it on the side of the curb. Uh, it was my neighbors. They were going to go to Germany, so they left that out there, and it had all the little K-cups in it and everything. It was working. Um, I had already had it, one of those, so I brought that, and um, out of that meeting, um, I said that I really wanted a couch to replace my old, beat down, broken, tore up couch. So um, I, I just said that, and then after the meeting, I, well, I heard another person say they really wanted a, um, a king size mattress, and I was like, I have one in my living room just sitting there bugging me. So um, it was only like three months old and it was really nice and there was really nothing wrong with it. Just, you know, it was uncomfortable to me so I couldn't return it. And so it just sat there and I tried to sell it on, uh, I think OfferUp or something and then that ended up not working out. So I approached this friend that was also in the meeting and I said, uh, you want a king size mattress? I have one. And um, I said, well, what do you want to trade? And she's like, didn't you say that you wanted like a couch set? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, actually. And um, I was thinking, okay, so it might not be the hit, you know, it might be that it wouldn't be the right one or not the right color or whatever. I went there and she took pictures. She showed me uh, the couch set and I was like, my mouth kind of dropped because I was like, it's exactly the same color I was looking for. Um, it matched my house perfectly. And it was a couch, um, a, a chair, and a love seat. And I was just like, perfect, let's do this. So like a couple weeks hap uh, happened because they were actually moving out of their old place and that's how it ended up working out. It was just the right time, the right place, the right situation, and um, the kind of funny thing about that is I, I can do a little bit of sign language. So uh, the person that I ended up doing this situation with is uh, hard of hearing. Her husband's completely deaf. And so all that communication and all the knowledge that I had, we were able to communicate perfectly fine. And uh, it all worked out. It was, just, it was just the right situation. It was perfect. So she ended up getting that... Uh, <laughs> King size mattress, I got my couch set, and I was just like, it wasn't supposed to be that easy. 
Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That is fantastic. What a great story. You can pass that story on. I think it's incredible. Um, who? Okay, keep going. Here we go. I love this. I, I, I love listening and hearing. And, and by the way, the next question is going to be, who, who did get, end up with something but maybe did not achieve their actual goal? And then I'm going to ask for brave souls who just didn't do it to share why. And believe me, I have some selected if nobody raised their hand. I don't. I really don't. But I would love to hear from a couple of you. It would be fantastic. Now, that could have easily been me because I got a really slow start because I just I don't like trading with strangers, doing all that crazy stuff. So I ended up trading with my kids. And what I ended up doing is I brought something that they traded me um, to our meeting. And then people wanted it. I, was, I wasn't surprised because it was something really cool. But people did want it. People kept coming up to me. Do you want to trade for this? Do you want to trade for that? And most of the things they wanted to trade me, I, I really didn't want to. And so then someone came and he, tr wanted to, he wanted it and he wanted to trade me something that I didn't want. So then he gave me a necklace instead. And it was a really cool pewter um, flag. And so I, I thought that was really cool. And my goal that I set up for myself is, um, I grew up in a Hispanic family but did not learn Spanish. I had taken Spanish in school several times and um, I wanted to get back to the conversational level that I left off. And so I decided that this necklace would be a great way to do that. So I put it on my neck mainly so I wouldn't lose it. And I walked in the door and my son right away said, oh my gosh, cool necklace. And I said, thanks. And he said, can I have it? And I said, I have to trade for this. I can't give this away. And so he asked me what I was trading. And I said, well, my goal is that I want to get back to a conversational level of Spanish. And I, I really need to work on that. And he said, well, I'm taking Spanish too. And I'm moving on with that. So he's like, hey, I'll be your teacher. And I said, okay. So he's working on it with me. That is outstanding. Can you say something for us in Spanish? <laughs> on I, the spot? On the spot. I don't care what it is. Muy bien. Muy bueno. All right. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. But look how it, brought, it came back around to your own children, you exactly. know? And then if you say, okay, now I want to go beyond that, that's where that crazy <laughs> stuff that you said mm -hmm. turns into some really good stuff. That's and it's great. lifelong for both of us. It's lifelong for both of us. That's beautiful. So. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else on this side? Did I miss anybody? Anybody? Okay, how about on that side? You know, I should be working on these plosives. Okay, how about on this side? Anybody on this side? Oh, okay. I was getting a little worried. Okay, I'll come to you in just a second. All right. So we are the family that did not complete our goal, but we have things towards our goal. Yes. Because our goal was um, when they built our house, they didn't finish a whole entire section upstairs. And so um, we need a bigger house, but don't want to pay for a bigger house. So we have an idea of moving our three boys up into a master suite, master bedroom. And so we've been trying to figure out finances and doing that. And luckily, my brother just got a new warehouse. Um, the people that were there before was a floor company, um, contractor, just all kinds of stuff. He went under during COVID and literally just left in the middle of the night. Left drywall, left tile, left carpet, left everything. My brother's like, well, I guess I'm just going to sell all this stuff and hopefully be able to, you know, get some money to repair some of the damages that were that were done to the building. And so I asked my brother, can I just work and clean and do different things and get the tile, get the drywall? We got carpet, it's not my favorite. I'd like to trade <laughs> Look how it. she looks over at him. <laughs> <laughs> I will really like to trade the carpet. Um, so that's still up in the air. Um, and my brother, who is going to be doing the drywalling, is in here. And I have switched with him for babysitting. He's oh, right back wow. there. So there he is right there. So hopefully I can get, we still need to do an electrician and a plumber. Um, so I got to figure out how I'm going to swindle that on mm -hmm. trading things. But I need a plumber. <laughs> do, do you see what's happening? There we so go. So what <laughs> happens is, is you say, 
I am looking for a plumber. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and some other carpet. <laughs> Do you see? Really nice gray carpet. <laughs> yeah, see, so you never know who's in the room, exactly. but I think that that's fantastic. So we made big strides since November. Yes, when we left on November, I, I told Jeff, I said, this is just silly. There's no, we've been wanting to do this for five years, and we've had blueprints done. It's been, what, five years? Yeah, see. And look, November to January. What? And here we are. Go on, girl. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, that's awesome, yes. Oh yeah, that's right, and then I'll swing around. Hi, uh, I didn't do anything the first after the first meeting because it was all in my head and it takes work and I didn't want to give my time to that, if you want me to be honest. <laughs> I then, love that, thank you. And then when we had to speak out what it was, I had set a keyboard and Sarah came over after the meeting, she's like, I have a keyboard, you can have it. And so, and so uh, we got together and I traded with her. That is outstanding. You got a keyboard so you can play. Can you play? I used to be able to play. <laughs> See, that's, that's one of my, Yeah, that's going to be mine too. I want to be able to play. That's that's awesome. All right. Okay. Can I stand up? Yes, please do. Okay. So, look at her. I need some space. So Go on now. Get get it. Go. So, get it. So, my goal was, well, really I was inspired by the power of the app. Because really so much about this was about what is it, the power of the ask, right? You have not because you ask not, and that was inspiring. So the first little bit, I traded a few things. I ended up with a $20 bill, and what was I going to trade that for? And then at your next meeting, you were super inspiring, talking about what was your stopping point. And so I really did a little bit of soul searching to go, okay, what makes you stop? And so I have a dream I shared a few times of different things. Everybody knows somebody who's going through a hard time, but so often we don't do anything because we don't know what to say. So I want to give people the words to say when we don't know what to say. And so I said, I have the goal of sending 100 care packages this Christmas. So I didn't meet that goal, but I am a missionary that lives on support, so I didn't have the means to send them all myself. But part of this business dream was not only to send care packages, but to send encouraging words with them. And the other part was, I'd love to be able to support businesses, small business owners, for everything in the package has like a spiritual parallel or a reason why it's in there. And so this year, I met a really cool single mom. She had these amazing candles, and I was like, oh, to Lisa. I said, I want to put your candles in my care package, right? The whole life candle for somebody that you lost. And I said, okay. So I bought her, I bought her candles, but I said, I can't really pay for her candles. So I said, okay, so what am I going to do? And I've sent care packages in the past to different people, and I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to ask people who've been blessed by these care packages to donate to these care packages. And so I asked, and that's not always a comfortable thing to do, and, and so I asked. And so um, I raised $2,000, and God was super gracious, and I was able to send 48 care packages. And also, not only just Christmas care packages, but then we were able to design... Um, one for a caretaker who's been taking care of her husband. We were able to design a cancer care package. We were able to design um, one for somebody who had a miscarriage that we're sending next week. So I have some money left over that we're going to keep sending. I'd love to rate, like make money as well, make it a real business someday. But so much of this has been able to, so I have the dream to be able to include a new business. It's called Freedom Creator Company. It's awesome. She's amazing. And so we're able to add that in. We were able to reach people we hadn't reached before. And then people that had been blessed we're able to be part of the blessing and be able to pay that for it. And then um, both of our cars were broken this Christmas, but luckily I know people who go out of town and let me their cars and it was okay. And so I took a care package to somebody that had um, lost their spouse and they had known that I had some car issues and they called me two weeks later and they said, hey, do you want my car? What? And so I just want to say publicly, um, my friend Bob always said, he said, if you take care of what's on God's heart, He'll take care of what's on your heart. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say, like, that whole idea to, like, dream big, and I haven't met all those dreams, and to be able to say, like, man, I have million-dollar dreams. I want to be able to hire trafficked women or refugees or all these different pieces of things. But to be able to be a blessing, God wants to bless you when you are a blessing. So that's my – so we have a brand-new car because we were just <laughs> taking care of blessing people. So there's our story. Whoa! <laughs> That's fantastic. And I have these happy cards that actually had gotten made up, so I don't have, it's not all there. But if you want my phone number, because if you know somebody who's going through a hard time and you want to be able to bless them in a way that you didn't know what to say and what to do, I'm going to put some on all your tables now. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, give her a hand. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Is there anyone else? Let's go through. Oh, here we go. That's okay. Um, I was really uncomfortable with the sign because I'm shy. And I didn't know, I didn't have a goal. So my first goal at the second meeting was to get some sort of a um, wellness thing. And it kind of felt weird with back and forth being sick. So I really thought about what I really wanted to do. My end goal was to go back to school. Um, I was hoping sign language. I dropped a lot of school with a semester left with my deaf education degree. And my son is nonverbal, so we use a lot of signing. So that was really my end goal. So I ended up er, trading my paper cup for two boxes of china. And I wanted to be able to craft to provide for my schooling. And I got a cricket and a bunch of craft supplies. So I've been able to save like $400, not a lot, but like to put towards school. So, wow, that is fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. Wow, anybody else? Let's see. Anybody else? Okay, here we go. Oh, we got some. Look, they're like, oh, I'll raise my hand. I'm coming over there. Let's go over. I'll go over here first and then I'll come back. To you. No, no, no. You went first, actually. So, so mine has not technically been completed yet because um, I'm in, in the middle of trying to renovate my home and my front yard because we have pretty significant uh, foundation damage. Um, so, I've been doing my best, aside from that, just taking care of my neighbors and my friends. I have chickens in my backyard, so I gave away a whole bunch of eggs. Well, um, when that, like, that really bad snowstorm happened, or not snowstorm, windstorm happened, uh, 110 mile winds, I looked out my front door and realized that I have a tree coming out of the ground right in my home. Well, word got to my friend that I always get eggs, and he came over and chopped down my trees. Wow. Um, I have a ton of firewood now and a yard full of trees not completely cut yet. <laughs> wow. Because he cut them down and took some tree took some wood. He's like, I don't have a fireplace though. And uh, that has uh, saved my house and it's one more thing down that I have in my house. So. That is fantastic. So. You know, it's bringing safety, it's bringing security. There's so much to that. So. Just one more goal. Plus, I have tons of firewood. <laughs> Anybody want to trade for some firewood? I'm just saying. All right. Thank you. That was fa Give her a hand. Okay. Who was it? All right. Here we go. <laughs> here, I'll hold it for you. Yeah, sorry. Um, good evening, everyone. I kind of switched my goal, um, like, a few days ago. Yes. So I still have a picture from my grade looking at it every day. So it's kind of that inspired me for me as my career which uh, was uh, to be more educated. So I started probably four years ago uh, a television class. So I'll be finishing my day. Oh, outstanding. You know, when, when we can be proud of ourselves, knowing that it has impacted our children, I think that that is like the greatest gift. You know, we always hear, I know that I do, be the change that you want to see in the world. But really, our change we are seeing is our children. So when you say it, it's like, be 
instead of be the change, our children are the change that we wanted to see in the world. And then they're going to take it from there. It's just phenomenal. I mean, think about it. There are some children, you know, like there's a little one over here who's never known life without COVID. Never known life without COVID. There are children that as soon as they are able to start, you know, using their fine motor skills, they already know how to operate a computer or a phone. That we don't even teach them all of it, it just comes innate. It's amazing what is happening. This is the change. We have just a little bit of time to still make a huge impression. Is there anyone that would say, I didn't do it, and this is why? Oh, yes. Look at it. She wants to start talking before I get the mic over there. Like, I'm going to just start playing, explaining. <laughs> That's okay. So, Regina is a great motivator. You really are. So I went to this meeting and I'm going to do this. So I even made a little pin for you. Okay. <laughs> this right here, after the first meeting, this is, this is what I had. It sat on my computer. So this is my paper clip right here with my ticket that I didn't win last meeting. Okay, so they gave us these notebooks. They gave us the paper clip. They gave us the ticket. Stick it all together. And I put this on my desk. Now turn that way and show them. Okay, so I set. So it's a notebook. It's a notebook with uh -huh. my paper clip. Okay? So I kept walking past my computer desk and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on social media today. I'm going to do something with this. Mm. And then my four year old would walk up and be like, Mommy, it's lunchtime. All right, let me make you some lunch. Let me make you some lunch. And then I do that and then I'd be like, Oh, look at the dishes. Let me do the dishes. Oh, wait, let me do this. Okay? So here I have my list of excuses. Okay, I work nights and I'm tired. Okay. So I come home, I sleep, I get up, and then I take care of my four-year-old. And then I got two teenagers and a five-year-old. So too much on my list to do on my days off, because my days off, I gotta go do my errands, I gotta do my grocery shopping, mm -hmm. I gotta do my stuff. Mm -hmm. Too many distractions, you know? My daughter's in volleyball, you know, my son has to go here, he's got practice, he's got work now, he's, you know, distractions. But what I realized about myself is this. I didn't make this project a priority. Mm. So, I tried, and after the second meeting, I did, I traded, okay, so again, not my comfort zone, this is my sister, okay. and she knits, she's talented, nice. so she knits and stuff, and I was like, just trade me something so I can do something, right? So she gave me this hat, but guess what I did? Nothing! Nothing! <laughs> Last minute, like, today, at probably like 10 o'clock, I was like... Hey, look, I'm a procrastinator, and I have this hat. Anybody want to trade? <laughs> Didn't get any hits, which I kind of expected. But here's what I got from this project, okay? Yeah. I have other projects like this around my home. So I now make them a priority. And how I make them a priority is I set a timer on my phone. And I say, this is what I'm going to do. When this timer goes off, I'm devoting my time to this. And if a distraction comes up, I'm like, okay, I'm going to set a new time, so I'm gonna go take care of this for an hour, but I'm coming back to this project. So I've learned, if I wanna get a project done, you gotta make a priority, and you gotta schedule it, and you gotta, otherwise it's, not, it's gonna be my red paper clip project. <laughs> <And it's nothing. laughs> I love it, <laughs> and you gotta stop making excuses. You stop Thank making you for sharing. Stuff. Thank you, give her a hand. There was somebody else who raised their hand. Yes. Two 
children and I had five. And that was 10 years ago. And I had to support them solely for the last 10 years. And I was a stay-at-home mother without any means of income. So, and because of my determination and my own goal, I put myself through school. And I earned enough money that I don't have to be in this program anymore. And I bought my own house five years ago. So I do say <laughs> I love that you said that, you know, it, it's like you have your own goals and you set them your way. And I think that that's fantastic. What I have learned is that when I invite other ways, it has gotten me in places that I never even imagined. I also looked and said, well, if I'm this way, can I expect my children to be any other way, right? But for you, you've accomplished many of the things that you wanted to, which I think is powerful, now what? Because what I always say is when you get to the top of the mountain, it only makes it easier to see the next summer, summit. We never stop obtaining new goals, ever. I want to thank everybody who did share. And I'm sure that there's others in here to share. So here's the thing. The red paper clip project wasn't just about achieving a goal. That was just the result at the end. There were many other pieces to this. One, being able to look deep inside yourself to see what is stopping you from reaching a goal, what is possible, and how you put parameters around yourself to say, this is the way I'm going to go. I'm not saying that any of that is wrong, but when you're ready to do something else and something different, now you have a tool to be able to achieve those things. This is just one of many ways you don't have to use a red paper clip. But it's even more that we learn in this exercise. But before I start sharing that, I want to tell you that I was standing in my bathroom. So there's th one of three things that I do every morning when I am getting ready for the day. I either listen to the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, which is a radio <laughs> personality, and I laugh my way through getting myself ready, or I find one really good movie that is only 60 minutes, meaning that's it. I got an hour in there, better get done, and I watch that. Or I just find out whatever Alexa is going to tell me. And so Alexa, all of a sudden, it pops up, red paper clip. I said, no way. What are, you, what are you talking about? 2020, red paper clip, are you kidding me? I said, yo, Alexa, she didn't answer. I was like, okay, Alexa. <laughs> and she starts playing or it starts playing this, this report of this young woman who learned about the red paper clip from the gentleman who did it 20 years before her. So she said, I want to see if it still works. And it did. She said, it blew her mind. You know what she did with her house? She sold it. And then she took the money and gave it away. And then she started all over again. She says, I'm going to just keep doing that and change people's lives. Phenomenal. I was just like, what? Because once you know that you have it, it's easy to give it away. Because it comes in abundance. It's just going to keep coming. You know, we were, you know, everybody was clapping. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Steve Shock, right, and his wife. How is Steve able to do this? He gives it away. He helps all of us. We have nice meals, and it just keeps rotating and keeps going, and it'll keep going. That's how it works. That's how it works. 
But let's take it even deeper. So I had uh, some handouts that was given to you that you should be able to see. I titled this one because it's all about the power of persuasion, but really what's it all about? And I kept trying to look up songs that had this in there because I thought, oh, you know, I could do something with that, you know. The only thing I could come up with was, what's it all about if we started out our feet? That's the only one, and it didn't go with nothing. <laughs> but the very first thing is just doing this exercise if you didn't know it already, it helps you to realize that you can get something from nothing or close to nothing. You really can. It was a red paper clip. That woman, she traded a hairpin. My students, I just tell them to rip a piece of paper out of their notebook. It really doesn't matter what it is. And there was somebody over here who, they, it wasn't even their paper clip, it was their own personal talents. It's about reaching deep inside and saying, what do I have to offer? And the moment you say that you have nothing, you're right. But it's just as easy to say, I have something. Because I'm telling you what, if you can see, you have something for those who can't. If you can touch, if you can walk, if you can talk, you have something that some people do not have. They need you. If nothing else, you have perspectives that others don't have. So let's go back to what you talked about. Ten years, five kids, doing it on your own. Achieving your own. You don't need this program no more. You just bought a house. There's people who don't know how to do that. You could literally train other people, consult other people, coach other people to do that. It makes a difference, right? These are the things that we can do. Here's something that we think that we, if you think you don't have anything, how about a heart? To give people something just from your heart to make a difference because it's not all about you. Somebody had said, I really didn't want to do this thing because I didn't want to get this materialistic thing. It's not all for me. But it wasn't about that. It was about you looking deep into what you can really do and achieve. Because if you can do it with a red paper clip and you get, you know, a pot, then you get a couch. You get something. And it's like, you can give it away. If you don't want it, give it away. You know? But it's teaching you something. Because there's no manual that really teaches us a lot of this stuff. So you do it. So then you look and you say, well, there's number two. This was about setting and reaching goals. Man, that was a perfect, I want to add your journey to the next time I do this and give credit in your name. That you have talked about what gets in the way? Not just about the paper clip, but anything else that you try to achieve. What's in your way? And who's watching you? You're not in this room because you just decided to, you know, hey, there's this thing called parent challenge and I wanna just go to it. No, you were doing it for your kids. So everything you do is an example for your kid. Why do you think that you have to come to these trainings? This is all about for your kids. 
And so when you go to set a goal, do you achieve it? Do you know how to set a goal? If you did the red paper clip, you know now how to do that. But you can do this. What is the next goal that you're going to achieve? Because we will be talking about setting your next goal between now and May. What are you going to achieve? I had a woman talk to me and she says, you know, let me tell you what I do. On my calendar, I started out writing down each month, what did I achieve for the month? And at the end of the year, right before New Year's hits, I just collect all of it and write it down and I can look and see what I've achieved for the year. And I said, wow, how's that working for you? She said, it's pretty good. I said, how about next year setting a goal for the next month and achieving that? Think about how much further you'll be. That's some powerful stuff. There's all kinds of ways that we can actually do that. All kinds of ways. It also was teaching you communication skills. Some of us don't, we, we can't go beyond our children, our family to speak as if we don't have something to say as if there's nothing out there in the world that can connect us. We're not an island. You cannot achieve anything solely by yourself. Someone has to trade with you. Somebody has to cheer you on. Even if you don't want the cheers, somebody has to believe in you. They got to buy your product. They got to believe in you enough that they are now going to have your child be trained in basketball. They got to believe that. Like, your child is worth it. But it takes the communication skills. Look at, look at what I said here. One, in communication, in order to really do it, you have to remove self-doubt. What are you telling yourself? How do you talk to yourself? How you talk to yourself, you cannot expect anyone to see you any more than that. Any more than that. If you say, you know what, I, I don't, I'm just not worth it. Guess what? Everybody will think you're not worth it. If you say, I'm gorgeous <laughs> every day. It's something about that swag. It's something, a way that you move that when you show up, other people say, wow, that person is so gorgeous. I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> You'd be like, I do. It's me. <laughs> right? But what are you saying to yourself as you believe you will achieve? If you have passion, you must turn it into action. And you can have, and you can be, and you can achieve anything that you want. Anything. Many of you know my story, most of you do. I mean, I had to say I wanted alphabets after my name. And I didn't want it to be ABC. I wanted it to be PhD. And as soon as I said that, it started to manifest and shape until it actually happened. It happened. I mean, we've got, she's getting ready to graduate in May. She wanted to be more educated. And it, to somebody else, that could have sound very abstract. But she knew exactly what she meant by it. She knew exactly what she wanted to do and bam, it was there, and her children get it too, and they're sitting around the table, and they're all doing homework, and guess what? They're all going to be doctors. They're all going to be something amazing. I need a job, just saying. <laughs> the other is that you have to be specific. This exercise was teaching us how to be specific 
because we started out very abstract. You know, here I got a paper clip. You got something that you can give to me. You know, I'll take anything. Until after a while, it's like, I'm looking for a couch. And you said it. And not only did you get a couch, you got the couch, the set. You know what I'm saying? This is what it's like. You just have to say it, and it just starts to happen. It happens. But you have to do something. You just can't sit there and be like, listen, I'm going to sit here and eat another piece of pecan pie, in which I am. But, you know, I'm going to just sit here. I'm going to eat this, and this is what I want. I want a million dollars. So I'm just going to sit here and wait for it. It doesn't work that way. You have to put the work in, and guess what? You have to say it out loud. People need to hear it. You, you just got somebody who's talking about a plumber, right? And I bet you there's somebody else in this room that's saying, I might have something else that I can do to help achieve that goal. Now be real specific. I need fill in the blank and be very clear. And it'll start happening. People just do that. Transfer your ideas to others. So it's not just about telling, I want some gray carpet. <laughs> okay. But when you start telling us the size of your house and where you want to put your children, what you're doing is you are transferring your idea to other people to illuminate for other people to be able to see it. Now they can see it. That's part of communicating and communication skills. So I have something, and it's a new term. I think I, I, think I need to get it in the dictionary or something or in leadership books. I call it inspirational networking. Inspirational networking is when you can transfer your ideas to other people for them to be able to see. Inspirational networking is when you can show them that you have something of value that maybe they need. Then you start to do trades, and it costs no one anything. It's a powerful, powerful piece. But here's another key. You must be open-minded to the opposite. Opposite of what you believe, opposite of what you've been doing, you have to be open-minded. I have been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion training for many, many years, and it got really con condensed and you know, concentrated over the past two years. And the pushback that I got for years is because people did not want to open up their minds because they are afraid that something's going to be taken from them. They have pride that keeps them from budging. But when I start to let people know that your pers perspective, your belief is valid, hold on to it, you should, because it's your experience, it's your way of doing things. But be open to a cultural mind shift, meaning that you're going to invite other ideas and say, huh, I didn't think about it that way. And you'll end up with much more than you ever, ever imagined. Then you have to listen. Now, there's a talent to listening. What's the difference between listening and hearing? If you're not sure, Go and try to talk to someone who watches football. Because <laughs> they're going to, yes, uh-huh, yeah, uh, yeah. Go, go, go. Yeah, yeah. They hear you, but they don't, they're not listening. I'm not saying every football player. Really. But w listening is when you can understand. So if you're having a conversation in your head because you want to come back and say something else, well, I'm just, you're not listening. There is so much to this parent's challenge that you have to listen to. Those who listen gets further in the program. 
Now, there could be two people that have their children who start this program at the exact same time. And one of them, for some reason, starts to do this. It's because they're listening to the opportunities. They're listening in the programs. They're understanding and they're applying it. Or they get to the very end and it looks like both have achieved the same, but one has the quality behind it. It takes true listening. Four, possibilities. When you do the red paper clip, then what that does is it opens your mind to the possibilities of what can be. It's possible to have and be anything you want. The possibilities are there for the taking. I think I asked this group, how long has the materials to make the cell phone been in existence? Anybody know? Forever. There's nothing new on this earth. We just had to condition our minds to be able to catch up with what's already out there to put it all together to make a cell phone or anything else. So anything, anything that you want to achieve is already out there. It's about conditioning the mind. I come from poverty, and there's something called the poverty mindset. When you have the poverty mindset, you never have enough. You're always trying to get. And it's always, you know, I got to get from here to pay that, and, and you know. And I don't have time to look at three years, five years, 10 years down the line, because I'm trying to deal with the here and now. I would like to be out there thinking about that, but I don't have the time. That is an impoverished mindset. It just is. And we're taught that before we're even conceived. It's a concrete way of thinking. I have students that come into my classroom that have an impoverished mindset. They have a concrete way of thinking. And so when I tell them to look beyond the pages that they're reading, share with me what you would, would think beyond what's on that paper, they can't answer that. They can only answer what is being seen there. When we're having a 68% graduation rate in our high schools, it's because the other 32%, right, they're, they don't see beyond just the moment. They're dropping out because of a situation right there. How are we training our kids to see far beyond? I'm talking about seeing themselves graduating from high school, seeing themselves into their job or going to college or something. How are we showing them that? You can't just tell them, you must show them. You have to lead by example. So we have to recondition our minds so the minds of our children can also be reconditioned. I told you about the fleas. How many of you did not hear about training fleas? Anybody not hear about training fleas? Oh, good. I love telling the story, so I'm going to tell it again. You can train fleas. If you take fleas and you put them in a jar and you put the lid on the jar, those fleas are going to try to jump out. But because they don't want to keep hitting their head on the, the, the lid, they just jump high enough to hover below the lid. So when you're looking at the jar of fleas and you can see space between the fleas and the lid, you can take the lid off. And those fleas will never jump out, ever. They're conditioned. And here's the other part. Neither will their babies. Their offsprings will not jump out because it passes from one generation to the next. Where is your limitation? 
that you're teaching your children? Is it in your dreams? Is it in your goal setting? Is it in opening your mind, having different perspectives? What are you teaching your children? Five, setting the example and proving it between now and May 2022. I want you to think for a moment. I want you to really think, what could you set between now and May that becomes a strong example to teach your children that you could stand up in May and say, this is what I did. No, better yet, instead of you standing up, your children could stand up. This is what my parent did, and this is what I did. What could you do that would be a strong, strong position? Really quickly, I want you to grab a pen, grab paper, you have it on the table, and without thinking, without thinking, I want you to jot down five things that you could do that would set an example for your kids. Five things. By now, everybody should have down at least two. You should have four by now. I know, it's like, girl, she's going too fast. <laughs> come on, squeeze out that one more, one more. What can you come up with? Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to think about your kids for a moment. I just want you to imagine your kids. And I want you to imagine them when they are 29 years old. Imagine when they're 29 years old. What would you hope that they will have achieved and I don't want anything they want. How would you like for them to be living? How would you want their stability to be? I want you to think about that. At 29 years old, let me tell you something. My son is 29. I want to live to be 102, I do. But if I were to leave this earth today, I'm secure in knowing that my son has achieved what I could imagine for him at 29. I would be comfortable with that. I know that he has. In two years, two and a half years, my son and I will be back here speaking as Dr. Lewis and Dr. Lewis. It's going to be a powerful, powerful piece. And my goal is to write a book and get it published in both of our names on the day that he graduates. That's my goal. And I can think of all the things that it will do to impact his life in a positive way for the future that follows after that. So now that you have pictured and you've solidified and you can see 29 years old, what you want to reach for your goal for your children or what you want them to be able to achieve, I want you to go back and look at that list and I want you to circle the one that would help in getting there. And if you didn't write one, if you say, oh, well, I didn't know we were going that deep, then write something down. What is that?
That is your goal for May 2022. Use all the skills, everything that you have, even when it gets hard, do it anyway. Set a timer. You get distracted, jump back on board. Here's some great communication secrets that you'll be able to use so it's on that next page. I didn't create these. It, it didn't come out the, um, the citation. I, I don't think I sent that piece, but I didn't create these, but I thought they were really good. The very first one, connect with yourself. You must first know who you are and have confidence in yourself and your ability to connect with others. If you don't, you've got to ask yourself, what is stopping me? Pride is not enough. You've got to connect with yourself. And here's a simple tip to do that. And I want you, I'm going to give you one simple tip, and I'm going to then have you write down a, another tip right next to it. Every morning, I just want you to Look in the mirror and say, I love you. At first, if you haven't done it, it's kind of awkward. Like, I love, I love you. <laughs> After a while, you're like, ooh, girl, I love you. You should see me. I just go all in and all in every day. But then I want you to write another one. So I want you to take a moment and just write down what would be a second way to connect with yourself. The next one, speak with sincerity. Nothing is more effective than being sincere when you communicate. And nothing is more important. Sincerity is the cornerstone for making a connection. You've got to be sincere. You've got to speak from your heart. Let me tell you something. Sister girl over here told me, you're going to have to step back because I need some room because I got something to say. And she had that passion. I mean, it was going everywhere. It was so sincere. And every time I could just hear her voice like crack, like any moment she's going to cry. And it's not because she was crying on the outside. It's because of crying of joy, crying of, you know, how deep this really is and how connected it is. And we all could feel it. We all could see it. That's what you've got to do. That's some powerful stuff. When my sister over here was talking about speaking Spanish, all I could think about is, listen, I need to learn Spanish. Maybe there's a trade. You know, I, I, you know just thinking. But you could see the passion, like, I got something here. This stuff is important. Be consistent. This is a problem that we all have. We're not consistent. We have to be consistent, even with our children. I raised Charles with consistency and consequences. If you do A, B will happen, <laughs> whatever that is. If I say, you know what, if you do A, then you will get B. I don't care what I had to do. It was guaranteed. But I remember one time, this was when they would count all your minutes on your phone. And he started having a phone. I said, listen, if you go over your minutes, for every minute you go over, it's a day without your phone. Oh, my goodness. That was the worst, because I needed him to have his phone. There, you've got to change something. It's not going to, you cannot stay the same. You have to change. You have to move forward. Truly listen. Make a point to listening to what the other person is saying. It not only gives you uh, more insight into whatever is being discussed, it also shows respect and builds connection. Truly, people love to be listened to. Why do you think I'm standing up here? <laughs> I love this stuff, you know? Every one of us grew up with a dream as to what we want to be or what we want to do. And whatever it is, no matter how crazy it is, somehow it morphs into it. My dream, I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be like MC Hammer. Anybody here at MC Hammer? I'm dating myself. I mean, I just knew I had it. I mean, you know. And I wanted to have a crowd bigger 
than Michael Jackson. That was my dream. I wanted to be on the stage. Here's my stage. I got there. My dance is my voice. It's amazing how it happens. And so we have to be able to, to think about that. Look beyond the words. Don't spend your time mentally preparing your next response. Somebody said that they were in their head. Where was she? Over here? She said, yes, you said, I was in my head, right? Instead, ask questions for clarification and to make certain you thoroughly understand what the other person is trying to say and really what is, what is this all about when we're in our head, we're stuck in just our own thoughts. Show respect. Everyone, no matter what position or role they're in, deserves to be treated with respect. By being respectful, you will set the tone of what your leadership is about and how you like to be spoken to. Respect bigots, begets respect. I was going to say bigots. <laughs> connect to identify. Try to genuinely connect with others and find a way to relate to them. Working with others in an effective way to develop a greater understanding, including our children. Know how to ask. Ooh, that's what this whole red paper clip was about, right? One of the most effective forms of communication is to ask questions. The ability to ask skillful questions and listen carefully to the responses is a huge factor in being a great communicator. Be genuine in your interest. It is one thing to communicate with people because you believe you have something to say. But it's even better to communicate with them because you believe they have something to say. Two more. Mind your unspoken language. Ooh, let me tell you something about that. We can't, sometimes we can't catch ourselves. Sometimes we need a, million, a mirror there because we'll give that look like, oh, oh, gee, you know. So we have to pay attention to that. Your posture and tone of voice can also play a part in what you say. Others' body speaks louder, our bodies speak louder than our words, and sometimes can convey a message that we don't intend to communicate. Ooh, ciao. You know, I had a student that came and was saying, can you just bump my grade up a little bit more? <laughs> I failed your class, and then was asking me during the break, you know I had an attitude. I had to do all kinds of facial management and get myself together, get the uniform on, the mask on. I was like, what, is, what, what did you ask? <laughs> you do know it's, you know, break. <laughs> but I had to work on that. And at the end, she says, thank you so much for listening to me. And I kind of felt guilty inside because I was like, I was really rolling my eyes and wondering why you're still standing here. But... <laughs> I'm glad it pulled off, but it really got me back into a place where I need to really pay attention to myself. And here's the last one. Two-way traffic only. Communication should never be a monologue. So you, it shouldn't just be one person talking. The best leaders create a dialogue by listening and inviting others to express themselves. So when they express themselves and they say something opposite of you, that should be OK, too. It only makes your ideas get stronger. It makes a huge difference. There's so much that I could share with you, at least 15 weeks, because that's how long it takes a semester. But we won't go there. Um, but I, I really do hope that you got something out of today and all the other times. I know that I'll see you again. I want to hear the things that you've achieved, because that's what's so exciting. I never felt comfortable with reading when they would say, can we get somebody to read the next paragraph or the next sentence? You know, when we were reading, reading Jane and Dick. I know that's way back. That was way, way back. But you would never catch my hand up. And every time that I stand up and read something to an audience, I'm in awe of myself. Because when I stopped saying that I can't, and I started saying I will, not I can, but I will. I will learn. I will do this. I'm standing up here doing it, and so can you. 
So again, thank you and congratulations to all of you who have set goals and strive for them. Thank you.